Sonoma Developmental Center, or SDC for short, was the first facility established in California specifically to cater towards those with developmental disabilities. Founded in the late 1800s, SDC was in operation for over 100 years and only recently closed in 2018. The sprawling campus features a variety of types of architecture as it was updated over the years. Today, the grounds remain well maintained, but the facility itself is nearly completely empty. Since its closure in 2018, lawmakers are deciding what to do with the site, but for the time being, it's in somewhat of a limbo state. Join me for a tour of SDC, as well a deep dive into its history. While we take a look at what the campus looks like today, we'll be going over the facility's past, present, and future. Portions of the story might be uncomfortable for some, so feel free to use the chapters to skip through those sections if you'd like. In 1883, two prominent San Francisco mothers, Julia Judah and Frances Bentley, founded the California Association for the Care and Training of Feeble-Minded Children. Both women were mothers of mentally handicapped children and were unsatisfied with the care available to their kids at the time. The goal of the association was, and I quote, to provide and maintain a school and asylum for the feeble-minded in which they may be trained to usefulness. With this being said, they were able to garner enough support to open up their first location at the White Sulphur Springs near Vallejo. It was then relocated to Fasking Park in Alameda County. Shortly after, it was once again relocated, but this time with state assistance. The new facility was located in Santa Clara and was 51 acres, much more accommodating than the previous two locations. As you can assume from the title of the video, the home outgrew the Santa Clara facility a short four years after moving in. And finally, this move would be the last one. With the state now heavily involved, a board of trustees was put in place to select a new location. The property they chose was known as the William McPherson Hill Ranch near Glen Ellen in Sonoma County. The 1,700 acres in the beautiful hills of Sonoma County offered plenty of space and greenery for the facility to grow. Furthermore, the pleasant surroundings of the area tied in well with the type of asylum that was being adopted. The style was known as the Kirkbride Plan. The Kirkbride Plan was a type of mental asylum designed and advocated by psychiatrist Thomas Kirkbride. This model of asylum was most prominent from the mid to late 1800s. The facilities were very expansive and were considered cutting edge at the time. The design of Kirkbride facilities was based on ideas at the time which were thought to help in healing those who were mentally ill. The main design elements adopted were meant to maximize exposure to natural light and air circulation. The feature that all Kirkbride facilities shared was the Batwing floor plan. The floor plan featured a center office with wings branching out from the left and right sides. The oldest building that remains at Sonoma Developmental Center today is actually the original Kirkbride building. However, all that remains is the center office, as both wings have been demolished. While clients at SDC originally were housed in this building, as time went on and the number of patients increased, the facility transitioned to a cottage-style type of living to meet the growing occupancy needs. Another element of the Kirkbride plan that was adopted at this facility was the idea that work and physical activity was the best way to treat those with developmental disabilities. In addition to enrolling patients in the on-site school as well having them participate in recreational activities, nearly all clients who were able-bodied were put to work as it was seen as a valid method of treatment at the time. With that being said, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, patients were actually the main source of labor at the facility involved with jobs including farming, cooking, laundry, construction, and janitorial duties. Furthermore, some would even work administrative positions. This really highlights the difference between SDC and earlier asylum facilities. 
While by today's standards, the early practices of Sonoma Developmental Center seem incredibly dated, at the time, the work style treatment was cutting edge and thought to genuinely help. Instead of being committed to a room in an asylum, patients here who were able-bodied would have jobs and responsibilities that would resemble something closer to a normal routine. When SDC first opened up, the main patients were primarily mentally impaired children and some young adults. However, as time went on and the campus continued to expand, the facility began to take in individuals spanning an age as well disabilities. SDC started accepting patients for a variety of reasons ranging from physical deformities such as missing limbs and cleft palates to individuals that were just considered delinquents or unruly. Furthermore, as the site expanded, the campus became less self-sufficient and required increased outside workers. Many consider this transition, which happened just before 1910, the end of the original purpose of the facility. One thing I'd like to point out is that I've been referring to this facility as the Sonoma Developmental Center since its beginning. However, the original name from its inception in the 1800s was the California Home for the Care and Training of Feeble-Minded Children. While not appropriate today, at the time this name highlighted the mission statement for the facility to take care of cognitively impaired children and help them to be able to live more normal lives. As I was touching on earlier, the transition to a wider scope of patients likely led to the renaming of the facility to the Sonoma State Home, which happened in 1909. It was renamed once more to the Sonoma State Hospital in 1953, with its final name change taking place in 1986. Around the time of the initial transition to a wider scope of patients, a eugenics law was signed into effect in California that legalized involuntary sterilization. For those of you who don't know, sterilization is a surgical process of permanently preventing reproduction in both men and women. While this is recognized as wildly unethical today, the justification at the time was that it would prevent the spread of undesirable traits. California surprisingly was a forerunner in the eugenics movement in the United States, conducting one-third or 20,000 of all procedures done in the country. Furthermore, Sonoma Developmental Center completed 5,530 of these, more than any other facility in the nation. The reason for this is a combination of a very pro-eugenic superintendent, known as R.O. Butler, who completed over 1,000 procedures himself and a large access to individuals who were deemed mentally deficient, allowing for involuntary completion of the procedure. During his time as superintendent, which started in 1918, the facility acted as a revolving operating room as youths and young adults who were disproportionately minorities would be committed to SDC solely to be eligible for involuntary sterilization. Reasons for being committed would be often as vague as what was considered manic depression, sexual deviancy, as well as general delinquency. Regularly, these victims would be released shortly after recovering from the procedure. SDC halted sterilizations in 1952. In addition to the eugenics movement, which was very present at the facility, SDC also engaged in human radiation experiments. Most notably covered by a 60-minute article, allegedly, thousands of individuals, including children, had been used in radiation experiments. During a study on cerebral palsy patients between 1955 and 1960, admissions of individuals with the condition rose by 300%. Many of these victims would be subjected to painful procedures in which air would be injected into the spine or brain before x-rays were taken. To this day, these experiments are still being investigated. There are a lot more details on both of these topics that I omitted, as I don't want to delve too deep into these sensitive conversations. If you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to look at the various news and academic articles available online. 
As time went on, and knowledge regarding mental disabilities improved, the style of treatment at Sonoma Developmental Center evolved to be more medically oriented. Patients would be trained for self-sufficiency instead of trying to be kept occupied through work. Buildings would be renovated or demolished to make way for newer structures that catered more towards these principles. Notably, there was a large update between 1979 in 1982 in which all living units were modernized. Despite the shift towards more modern approaches, after the turn of the 21st century, the transition to community-based developmental centers began to be the more popular option for families committing their loved ones. Instead of sending their children or siblings away, families would be able to have their relatives incorporated into their community to some degree. With public sentiment towards large asylum-style facilities waning, and regular controversies regarding patient treatment in the news, occupancy would continue to dwindle into the 2010s. By 2015, this combined with the high costs of running such a large facility led to the announced planned closure of Sonoma Developmental Center in 2018. The plan was to have the remaining 300 patients relocated as well to have the campus reused to some degree. On December 31st, 2018, SDC closed, ending the 120 year plus run of the facility. Today, the campus is vacant, yet remains landscaped and maintained to a degree. The facility cemetery in the back of the property, which dates back to the 1800s and contains over 1400 unmarked graves, is being renovated to honor those who found the area as their final resting place. There are plans in place to develop the property, turning the area into low-income housing as well a community center of some sort. There has been local backlash against the idea of urbanizing the campus due to the rural nature of the area. It seems a contract has been awarded to a developer, but this could change as there have already been suits filed to halt development, citing fire risk, open space and wildlife preserves, as well as preservation of historic buildings. However, on a website outlining the plan to reuse the property, there is mention of preserving and updating historical structures, which I hope is true. Regardless of the future of the facility, it is truly amazing to see such a substantial complex still standing and open to the public nonetheless. If you made it to the end of the video, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. This video was a bit challenging for me due to the sensitive nature of the content. However, I feel that this history is far too important to not have in the public sphere. Thanks again, and please make sure to subscribe.